Okay, fantastic. Um, welcome uh, today to this IPPR panel event. Clearly, IPPR is where it's at at Tory Conference this year. We're absolutely packed, so um, <laughs> welcome. Uh, my name is Harry Quarterpenner. I'm Director of Research and Engagement here at IPPR. It's my pleasure to be chairing today's panel and to welcome you all to the discussion. So today's topic is, um, can better health revitalize our economy? Um, and with the Conservative Party setting a new 2.5% growth target, that's never been a more topical or urgent question for us to be grappling with. Um, it's a topic that we've been doing a huge amount of thinking about here at IPPR. Um, we've launched our Commission on Health and Prosperity Cross-Party Representation, chaired by Lord Darcy and Dame uh, Sally Davis. Um, and we've put out our initial paper, which looked at the relationship between uh, health and prosperity, and we'll be doing more work over the next year, and the final report comes out next year, ahead of the potential general election. So um, today's topic, we will feed in some of our thinking, and we will continue the conversation afterwards, so please do, do keep in touch. So, before we come to um, our amazing panel of speakers, I'm going to ask um, Chris Thomas, who heads up our commission, to just say a few words um, about the work we're doing and about some of those early findings. And then we'll come to Henry and then we'll open up to the, to the wider panel. So Chris, um, if you want to kick off. Brilliant, thanks Harry. And lovely to see so many of you. Um, seating room only uh, is a good sign for an event. Um, so I want to start just by reflecting that um, it, it strikes us that the, the value of health, the idea that health has a value, is something that has been something of a historic constant. So brushing off some, some schoolboy Latin, uh, we've got uh, Cicero saying, salus populi suprema lex, so health is the first wealth. And that idea of health and wealth has been uh, an argument that has had traction through history. Um, except that if we look at where the UK finds itself, its health isn't particularly good at the moment. So in terms of uh, say an assessment against the rest of the G7, uh, we find ourselves across, say, prevention, healthcare capacity, the spread of innovation, the things that matter in the kind of health world, find ourselves in sixth ahead of the United States, but well behind countries like Italy, Japan, uh, and others that, that make up that group. Um, and so that's, we think, a challenge and really the inspiring reason why we've launched the Commission on Health and Prosperity, um, as Harry mentioned, chaired by Lord Aradasi, Dame Sally Davis, and then made up of what we think is a coalition of people that reflect both the health sector, but also the rest of the value of health, so businesses, trade unions, uh, epidemiologists, economists, uh, what we hope is a very broad coalition of people that can put forward that case. In terms of informing this discussion, I just wanted to share a few of the first findings, and hopefully they're useful things for the panellists to, to have uh, as we go through the discussion. Um, but three findings to share. The first is that the Commission in April looked at what's happened to the UK labour market since COVID. We found that compared to trends before the pandemic, there were 1.1 million extra people out of the labour market, so avoidably out of the labour market. We also found that of those people, whilst some were down to, you know, kind of immigration flows, some were down, you know, it's down to study, 400,000 of those were down to increases in long-term illness. So really reflective of the kind of extent to which health is a massive factor in the labour market, an untapped factor, a source of policy levers that we haven't necessarily made the most of. We also found from the levelling up perspective that if local authorities had at least the health of the 10th percentile local authorities, so not all being the very best, but all at a very decent standard. And we know countries like Japan have that low level of inequality that we'd add 1.5% uh, to GVA per hour worked. We haven't achieved a 1.5% uh, per hour raise in, in productivity any year since the financial crash. So that's just to put in context the scale of that finding. And we also found coming back, I've mentioned Japan, that if we were to reach the levels of health seen in Japan, a country that in the 1960s was the lowest lived, lo uh, shortest lived country in the G7, it's had a remarkable transformation, um, that if we were to reach their levels of health, that we would add 1.2% to productivity, and we would see morbidity benefits across the entire population. It would be uh, most felt by young people, but actually a fairly even spread of benefits by place, by age, by demographic. So we think that's testament to the value of health to prosperity. Our commission 
will now go out for the next 15 months, explore that case. We'll be publishing final findings and a plan to harness that value uh, at the end of next year. Um, but I'm excited to hear what other panelists think, and uh, it feels like that case for health and prosperity is growing quite significantly as we go through. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm going to come to, to you next, Henry. So um, Henry is a lead non-executive board member of the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, co-founder of Liam Restaurant Chain, of course, but also recently led the uh, National uh, Food Strategy. Um, so uh, it'd be great to hear your perspective and, and that how food, I guess, demonstrates that link between health and wealth. So I think the question is, how can health support uh, a productive economy? I don't think there's any debate that it can, and there's really no debate that there are levels of sickness, and you've just set them out, are massively holding back our society. Um, I think that I am, I'd probably right to say, of the panellists, I'm the only person who's never been a member of the Tory party. And so I thought that I could... <laughs> I assume because you've worked for number 10, you might have done, but... So I thought it would be useful. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so I thought, to, I thought what might be useful is to set out the nature of the problem and why I think it is such a complicated problem, it has been such a complicated problem in recent times for the Tory party, but not historically. And then I could leave it to those of you here to say, well, if that's the problem, how can the Tory party solve it? So uh, the National Food Strategy was actually commissioned by Michael Gove when he was uh, Secretary of State at uh, DEFRA. And my job was to say, how can we create a food system that not only provides plenteous, secure supply of food, but does so in a way that doesn't destroy the environment and doesn't make us sick. And it's hard to overestimate or uh, uh, exaggerate how much it is, it is making us sick. You know, the fact that Chris Whitty, I mentioned this earlier on today, the busiest man, one of the busiest men in the country during COVID, actually spent his free time in the evenings giving online lectures about the harm that the food system was causing to the NHS gives you uh, an understanding of people who see the data. I'm sure Lord Bethel mm. will talk about it because he is a recent convert to this, having been in health during COVID. And you can be as ideological as you want before you see the data. And then you realise that actually, unless we do something about this, the NHS is going to suck up all of the money from the rest of society because it's just going to get worse and worse. At the moment, we think that by 2035, Treating type 2 diabetes alone will cost more than treating all cancers do today. It's a big, big problem. And the nature of the problem actually comes from a huge, one of humanity's great successes. It comes from us solving the Malthusian problem after the war in 1945. There are about 2.5 billion of us. Uh, we projected that that would grow to about 9 billion over the next 100 years without 7.8. And if you look at the front pages of the newspapers at that time, people genuinely thought we weren't going to be able to feed that population. There would be mass starvation. And what happened was what is known as the Green Revolution, maybe a sense of irony in that now, which was a, a farmer called Norman Borlaug uh, from Idaho, a crop scientist who created a, a high-yielding, short-stem form of wheat that combined with nitrogen fertilizer and modern irrigation transformed the amount of food we could produce off the same uh, amount of land. And that spread to maize and to rice. We now feed 7.8 billion people of actually slightly less land than we did back then. Uh, and we create 1.7 times the number of calories per person. This century, if you look at all of the famines and starvation events, they have all been caused by war or political turmoil mm -hmm. or corruption. There isn't one yet this century that has been caused simply by food shortage. But the problem with that great success was the nature of the food that it uh, uh, that it created and the impact it had on the environment. I'm not talking about the environment today, but as we increased the supply of food, so we got sick. And the reason for this is what we call, well, let's say the, 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 re the things that aren't the reason, the sun uh, last year when um, Boris delayed the advertising, restriction on advertising promotions, had a typically vigorous sun says leader that said, uh, it's absolutely fantastic that Boris has uh, stopped this advertising intervention. Uh, we need to focus on the common sense solutions, exercise and education. And not only are those two things actually provably wrong for reasons I'll come on to, but it, it suggests that anyone who has struggled with their weight is struggling with their weight. It's their own fat fault. And if people just had a bit more discipline and got off their ass, we wouldn't have that problem. Now, we haven't had 
a mass failure of willpower in the human race in the last 20 years. So something else is going on. Scientifically, exercise does not work. So the body tries to uh, create homeostasis. So when you exercise, it actually stops spending money, spending energy on other functions, such as reproduction. If you look at all of the long-term studies, uh, you, it, 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 you very marginally increase your energy output, but actually the body uh, reduces energy spent elsewhere, which is a disaster because it is the single best thing you could do for your health. Um, so we tell everyone that you should exercise to lose weight. It's quite good actually for maintaining weight loss for reasons I won't go into today, but it's rubbish for making you lose weight. We tell them you should exercise, they don't lose weight, they give up. The most disastrous thing they could do. And education, while we have a skills gap in cooking, everyone knows uh, and measurably what they should be eating, but they struggle to eat it. And why do they struggle to eat it? They struggle to eat it because there has developed a toxic reinforcing feedback loop between the commercial incentives of companies and the type of food that our body seeks out. Highly calorie dense food, high in sugar and fat and salt. We love it, we seek it out. When it's low in insoluble fiber, it fills up less quickly. We eat more of it, they market more of it. We eat more of it, they market more of it. We get sick. And they are as stuck in this cycle as us. So if you talk to the CEOs of food companies, they will admit, you know, we are being drawn into this kind of, you know, food production, because if we don't do it, someone else will do it. That is where the money is. And the extent of the pollution of our food system is also quite astonishing. If you look at the biggest fast-moving consumer goods companies, the packaged food companies, 85% of what they produce was deemed by the World Health Organization to be not fit to market to children. 50% of what we eat is now ultra-processed. So how do you solve this problem? There is only... There are a number of things you have to do, so we do have to improve education, but you need to break this feedback loop. You need to make it less attractive for companies to market that stuff to us. And actually, at an event I was at the other day, Dave <coughs> Lewis, the former head of Tesco, who's made former, so he can say this out loud now without being fired, concluded this big round table uh, with all of these CEOs of food companies saying, I have realised now that we need more intervention but more intervention is incredibly difficult. So, for example, Camilla, the last good intervention, I'm sure she'll talk a bit more about this, that we have had in this area on sugary drinks, she had to put that through the budget with George Osborne because if it had gone for right around, it would have been killed by the other departments. So there is something in the kind of nanny state mentality of not wanting to regulate that has got into the Tory party's genes well, actually, what you should be talking about is how do I protect children? How do I create a more dynamic, more uh, healthier population that can grow, achieve, be creative? And unless you change that narrative, you won't be able to get the policies in which will change the reality. But I am uh, going to hand over at that point to those on this panel who will have a much better understanding about how you can change that narrative than I do. Fantastic. Thank you, Henry. Uh, I'm actually going to come to you next, Camilla. Camilla Cavendish, who is uh, FT columnist and former head of um, Number 10 Policy Unit. It would be great to hear your perspective on this. Um, look, there's so much to say. and It's a very hot room and we're all waiting for Michael. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so I, I, will just, I will just respond to a few points. And by the way, if you haven't read Henry's report, this is absolutely brilliant. I have read every word of it. It's quite a big document but it's really worth it because he draws these links between agriculture and farming and, and food in a way that I don't think anyone's done before. Um, I think the pandemic really exposed that our vulnerabilities on this, and what surprises me is that that hasn't led to a rethink. And I went back and worked in the Department of Health um, for a couple of months in the pandemic, and um, it was really, really obvious to me and others that we and the US were going to suffer worse from COVID because of our health inequality. Those of us who've studied this, we knew our outcomes were going to be worse. And when the data started coming in from New York, which we did in about April 2020, the biggest risk factor was age, the next biggest risk factor was obesity. And, you know, for all those people who've shouted at me for years for daring to talk about this stuff, the reality is that we have left people in a really vulnerable position. And we can argue about whether that is government's role, but at that point I sort of thought it kind of perhaps was government's role. And I, and I hope that that in some ways will change the conversation. And, um, the point that you made earlier, Harry, about economic activity, 
it's really interesting. The latest data shows that we now have 400,000 people long-term sick in their 50s and 60s who are not in the labour market. We actually have fewer average weekly hours work than we did in 2019, which is one reason why we have labour shortages, because, in fact, the economic activity rate is really high. Now, some of that may be NHS backlog, but we know we have this huge mass of people living with chronic disease at younger and younger ages. Um, and we, I'm afraid, and the US, are again, are worse on this. So I wrote a book a few years ago. I went to eight different countries, including the Japan, US, and Italy that you mentioned, and I looked at all of this. And it is quite staggering how different countries are. And I don't think that is to do with physiology. I'm afraid I do think that is to do with our diets and our cultures around diets. And if you go to Japan, as I did, and you mentioned it, mm. Japan is fascinating. They are the only country in the world I know of that have improved healthy life expectancy. What matters is not how long we live, but are we going to have 10 years of our life in really poor health? And at the moment, in this country, we have a sort of 18-year gap in that depending on where you live, which is also terrible. I mean, if you're the richest 10%, you're likely to get 18 more years in good health than in the poorest 10%. To me, that is a social justice issue. That is a problem. Um, it's the same in the US. But Japan has painstakingly gone about trying to close that gap, and it has done that. And it has done that partly through exercise, Henry, where I'm going to disagree with you, but we won't go into that. But please, please, nobody in this room take away the idea that you shouldn't exercise. exercise. No, it's the research, best thing you can possibly do. No, yeah. but, but it is the single best thing you can possibly do for a whole range of reasons, but we can argue about But they've also looked at that <coughs> diet. Um, so I'll just tell one story that really struck me, because I used to be a libertarian. I do not come from the kind of, you know, middle wing of the Tory party. Which I was a libertarian, I was against the smoking ban. Then I became a parent. And then I also got involved in the NHS and sat on various boards and saw that the NHS was literally having to build bigger beds. It was having to see people with type 2 diabetes, all the things that have been mentioned, with chronic, chronic illnesses that were really holding people back, many of which are avoidable. Type 2 diabetes, not type 1. Type 2 is avoidable. And yet it is costing us all and, and creating a lot of misery. Um, and once I had kids, I realized that when you go around the supermarket with a bunch of kids, it is an absolute nightmare because they are the food companies are brilliant. And I talk to a lot of food CEOs, and you know, they are trying, many of them trying to do the right thing. But food companies will say, well, we're marketing things as treats. But the problem is they're not treats anymore. So if you look at the data, it's every day. It's not that people are having you know, chocolate on the weekend. They're having them every <coughs> single day. And this is where the food companies, I agree, Henry, are in a real fix. Because they say, this is all part of a balanced diet. But they don't want to produce the balanced diet because they don't make so much money at it. The one story I'll tell is about the rats diving into the cheesecake. I met a guy, I interviewed a guy in California who studied rats in a lab. And they'd offered rats a whole range of foods. What they liked most was cheesecake because it is the ultimate. I mean, most of us would be the same. Offered a lot of cheesecake. The rats got to the point where they were diving in, into the cheesecake to gorge themselves into all over their whiskers. And they then stopped a terrible experiment. They then removed the cheesecake. Some of the rats died because they would ref they refused to eat any alternative food. <laughs> they had basically become addicted. And there is a strain of thought, which I agree with, that sugar and a combination of sugar and fat is addictive. It is as addictive as nicotine. It hits the same dopamine centers in the brain. And that is partly why we can't lose weight. Because it's addictive. And it, as I totally agree, it's not about pull yourself together. It's, it's, it's out there and it's addictive. Um, so one final point on the sugar tax, which you mentioned. Um, the sugar tax was part of a bigger package of measures, which I believe it's now six years on this measure system. Um, the sugar tax was never going to fix obesity. Mm -hmm. But one thing I would say, there's been a complete and persistent mis misunderstanding of the sugar tax, not by you, but everyone else. We, it wasn't <laughs> a sin tax. The intention was not to make sugary drinks more expensive. Yeah. The intention was to get companies to take sugar yeah. out of the drinks. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it succeeded because we're not raising much money from it. It wasn't a revenue-raising, nanny-state syntax. It was an experiment that showed that big companies which had said, we can't possibly remove sugar from drinks, found it really, really easy to remove sugar from drinks, and are still making big profits. Because what's happened is that everybody is still drinking their products. Mm. And I don't think that is nanny-state. I think it's clever regulation. And I think if we're looking at solutions, we probably have to do more of that because there are a lot of companies that actually would be happy to work with the government to do the work. So that's all I'll say. Fantastic. Um, 
Lord Bethel, uh, former Parli Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for the Department of Health and Social Care, and I guess one of the biggest champions now of this health and wealth link. Do you want to um, come in next? Well, I, I completely endorse what Henry and Camilla said. I, I, my most miserable experience in the, in the pandemic was the 8.30 call when we rang on our big Zoom the ITU units up and down the country, and they would say, oh, we've got 25 beds, but 23 are full, but we've got 40 people who are overweight waiting in A&E, and they're all heading our way, so we're going to have to decant some, some of our patients to other hospitals. And that sense of Britain being ill, and, and particularly through comorbidities like obesity, really hit me hard, and that's why I am very passionate about this debate. And one of the things that is going on is that there's a huge technological revolution that means a lot of preventative medicines and preventative measures are absolutely surging forward in their efficacy. The use of big data, of AI, of vaccines, which we saw for ourselves, and, and of diagnostics. It's really incredibly exciting. And Britain is at the heart of a lot of this progress. So in terms of the sort of ec economic value of this, that's great. But there's no technological revolution that's going to ride to the rescue of this country. We can't get right the cleaning up of our air, the uh, addressing of the obesity challenge, the insulation of our homes. If we don't address the big drivers of illness in our country, <coughs> we're going to be stuck in the same place, which is to have massive demand uh, on our NHS uh, and our care services. And in terms of the economics, it's absolutely right that if we can get longer productive lives and people working uh, at, at the, at, with their best health, there's going to be a lot of uh, economic <coughs> benefits in that. Uh, but only if we can resolve the issue of, trying to, of having to double run um, the system so that we are looking after the people who are ill today and of preventing illness tomorrow. And we have to somehow resolve that <coughs> issue. And that is a challenge for the Treasury and for our political masters and for the private sector to figure out outcome-based uh, remuneration. There's a big economic uh, challenge there that, I, that needs to be uh, greatly focused on. But the politics, and this is my final point, I'll try to keep it brief. The politics of this, I think, um, show huge potential. I've got to tell you that being the <coughs> Minister for Therapeutic Drugs and Test and Trace got me no political plaudits in the pandemic at all. In fact, <laughs> telling millions of people, tens of millions of people to stick swabs up their nose uh, <laughs> was utterly miserable, despite the uh, importance of that work. But being vaccines minister, oh my God, Nadine Sethawi made a massive political career. <coughs> and telling people that you had the answer to preventing them from getting disease proved to be political dynamite. So prevention can be a fantastic political message to, to deliver. At the moment, politicians are stuck in a cul-de-sac of talking about waiting lists and of talking about GP appointments. There is no, there is no uh, political benefit from that rationing conversation. The conversation that we should be having with the electorate is about, stop, about preventing our children from getting ill and giving our parents the best possible healthy long life. And the politicians who are brave enough to detach themselves from the problems and the, and the operational challenges of today and to try to reframe the debate about preventing illness, I think, can, can um, ha have a really winning formula in the election. But making that transition does require resolving the other two challenges, the economics and the driving of uh, the environment in which uh, people live. And if you can do that, I think that uh, there's a massive opportunity. Fantastic. Um, Dolly, I'm going to come to you next. You're Research Associate in Population Health Interventions at the University of Cambridge. So the wisdom on the panel. Over to you. <laughs> no pressure. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this panel. Um, I have my QPR lan lanyard and uh, it makes me one of two QPR supporters on the panel, which makes it an absolute giddy. Um, but in addition to, to, to being a QPR supporter, I, I identify as a Tory and someone in public health which is not something you often hear in combination. And that was proven to me when I started my PhD. And I cannot tell you how many comments I got from people in public health. How are you a Tory in public health? And that identity and sort of ideological clash, the perception clash is uh, still rooted in this area to this day. And it also sparked this fascination to understand, you know, where did that come from? Has that always been the case? Has it always been something that the Conservative Party struggles with and finds hard to reconcile interventions on health and prioritisation of health? 
and it turns out it hasn't. And I want to read one of my favourite passages from uh, Disraeli, a speech that he gave in Manchester in 1872. And he starts by saying, Sanita sanitas, sanitatum, omnia sanitas, health above everything. He says, gentlemen, which I'm very glad today with my 50-50 uh, bag would be <laughs> people or MPs or my colleagues. It is impossible to overrate the importance of the subject. After all, the first consideration of a minister should be the health of the people. A land may be covered with historic trophies, with museums of science and galleries of art, with universities and with libraries. The people may be civilised and indigenous. The country may be even famous in the annals and actions of the world. But, gentlemen, if the population every 10 years decreases and the stature of the race every 10 years diminishes, the history of that country will soon be the history of the past. And of course, for me, a nation in largely poor health, as we've heard, heavily reliant on health care and dying earlier than previous generations is not going to facilitate a strong productive economy. And we've heard some great statistics, which I won't go over again, but I will use one that um, is pretty shocking and not, not, I don't hear it used enough, but the OECD found that the average tax bills were over £500 per person per year higher in the UK than they would be if everyone were a healthy weight. So we were looking particular, uh, particularly at the, the obesity epidemic. And a nation in poor health isn't able to contribute to the economy well, as we've heard, taking more sick days and more health care aren't as productive when they're working. And we know that the cost of the UK society overall stands at 58 billion every year, and that's over 30 million um, extra sick days, lost productivity, social care costs, and 4 billion in the welfare payments that um, you have when people are out of work. And these chronic productivity issues now characterise our economy, and it is critical, especially after COVID, again, as we've heard, that we stem the tide of people ex exiting the workforce due to ill health. But for me, good health, and I, we've heard of people being converted. So we've got people here who were sceptical at first about the role of the state in this. Um, I haven't had that conversion. Um, I saw health as absolutely fundamental to people being able to live their best life. And for me, good health is about every single one of our lives, our freedom and opportunity to live and enjoy the best life possible. And it was so refreshing when Lord William Haig earlier this year wrote an incredibly powerful piece in The Times, which uh, I would urge you all to read. Um, and in talking about the junk food cycle that uh, Henry so brilliantly um, wrote about in the National Food Strategy, he said food companies have an overwhelming incentive to design products that lead us even further down this chemically induced addiction to foods that make us overweight, more prone to disease and less able to work and enjoy life to the full. Uh, as Camilla said as well, this is not freedom. People do not sit down and say, I know I should eat better, but on the whole, I think it would be more fun to be grossly overweight. They are stuck, as Henry has said, in the cycle, and so are the producers f uh, feeding them. And he said, if we believe in freedom, we have to face up to this. Freedom is most crucially being free from oppression, violence or discrimination, but it is also the positive freedom, the freedom of a child to skip and somersault, of an adult to enjoy running down a country lane or in a city park, of an old person to keep their quality of life until their final days. Freedom is being well enough to, ch to work in your chosen career, to be strong enough to protect and care for your loved ones, to be fit enough to take part in sport and games. Freedom is climbing a mountain without physical distress and looking down from the top with exhilaration and wonder. These are the freedoms being denied to vast numbers of people who are the victims, not the free agents in a system that wants them to fill up with salt, sugar and saturated fat. So good health is the foundation of individual freedom. And now you might say that Disraeli and William Hague are hardly people that the current prime minister would align with. Um, <laughs> so I went back to the history books and dug out um, something by Robert Peel, who um, uh, our prime minister has spoken very much as being uh, someone he, uh, she aligns with. So he uh, introduced the 1802 Health and Morals of Apprentices Act to improve conditions in factories. And as a mill owner himself, he recognised that poor working conditions did not make for the best economic outcomes. And I found this fascinating quote by a chap who wrote about mills, uh, about Peel, Peel's mill factory conditions. And he said the peculiar healthiness of the people employed may be imputed partly to the judicious and humane regulations put in practice by Mr. Peel. 
So this idea that regulation is there to enhance every single person's opportunity to live their best life has been part of the Conservative Party from the beginning. So why is it today that we still do not um, find this argument easy to reconcile with? And this is ultimately in that framing and that narrative, which we need to create these arguments that Conservatives feel comfortable with and not just comfortable with, they feel excited by. Um, which we are absolutely working on doing and people like uh, William Hague have been brilliant in setting that out. But we also need to feel that confidence to actually see through the policies. And to finish off, um, I will just give you a bit of a background or context to the sheer number of policies that have been proposed by government today on this agenda. Um, I did an analysis of all 30 years of uh, obesity policies in England and we've had 689 individual policies proposed by government on this agenda in the last 30 years and yet no reduction in obesity or the related health inequalities. Almost 700 policies. And we're seeing it today that a new government comes in, is skeptical, scraps the previous government's strategy, including of their own party, then gets converted because they see the data and you get public health ministers and health ministers that see the reality of the issue and then end up reproposing the exact same policies. And we are now on potentially our fourth government strategy within a Conservative government alone. And that should be an embarrassment for a Conservative government that says it is waste-free, resourceful when it comes to government spending because the sheer waste of government resource and time and effort in all of these uh, is appalling. So we have legislation passed on issues at the moment that are looking at being scrapped or even repealed. So the first thing is that the government should just see through what it is already proposed and ensure that it doesn't go back on any. And it already has a whole list of fabulous recommendations that are incredibly evident and well considered in the national food strategy should also be put into to practice. So I would urge us to break that, what I call the nightmare policy cycle um, and just get on with implementing the ideas that we've had for over two decades now um, and put them into practice. Fantastic. Second Latin quote in one panel. Um, not, <laughs> not one Latin quote at the whole of Labour conference last week. So well done. We're doing well. We're doing well. Uh, Michael Gove, um, former Secretary of State for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, you championed uh, the health element in the in the Leveling Up white paper, which was a huge step forward. What would you like to see this government deliver in, in this in this space? Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the other panelists and thank you all for coming um, along here. Um, when I was listening to Camilla talking about having been a youthful libertarian, um, uh, but then uh, uh, her views changing over time, I was reminded of what my friend David Wilson said, which is that the definition of a conservative is a libertarian with children. Um, and <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't argue that the more children you have, the less libertarian and more conservative you are. Um, uh, obviously, that would mean that Jacob rees would be the least libertarian member of the, <laughs> of the current government. So, as, a, as, a, as an axiom, I think it holds, but within limits. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that I'm, I'm grateful to Dolly for outing me as a QPR fan. Um, uh, anyone who is a Conservative who is interested in health policy will understand the appeal of being a QPR fan, because every week you have your hopes raised and then dashed. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the, the prospect of an optimistic end to the year uh, is succeeded by the knowledge that um, you, you can't always get what you want, but sometimes you will be in good company. I couldn't be in better company than everyone here today. And I just wanted to say a few things, really to reinforce the messages that have already come out. The first thing is to, is to reinforce what, um, uh, what Dolly said um, uh, about uh, the conservative tradition of public health. So, uh, again, one could be forgiven for thinking that it is the case that conservatives' automatic reaction to any public health measure is, eh, nanny state, get out of my life. I'm a sovereign individual. Let me ingest what I want. That is not the conservative tradition. So uh, Dolly mentioned uh, Disraeli, and of course it was the case that the, the signature domestic reforms of the Disraeli government were public health reforms, changes to sanitation and changes to housing that were explicitly designed to ensure that working people led more fruitful lives. Similarly, it was the case that uh, the domestic reforms uh, of uh, the Marx and Salisbury's administration were principally in the area of housing. And then during the period, Conservative uh, uh, government, or Conservative and Coalition government as it were, from 1929 right through to 1940. Again, we remember those as grim economic years for understandable reasons, but they were also years of significant reform 
in public health. So uh, Stanley Golden, in particular Neville Chamberlain, introduced uh, uh, local government acts which made explicit provision for improved municipal health care. They introduced a Factories Act, um, which was explicitly designed to protect people in the workplace. They introduced a Holiday with Pay Act, which was explicitly designed to ensure that uh, individuals enjoyed <coughs> both rights of the workplace and a chance for fruitful leisure, which involved exercise. And, of course, uh, that government also introduced housing legislation um, as well, which was explicitly designed to deal with slum clearance. It was the case that the Conservative governments from uh, 1951 to 1964, with uh, Winston Churchill and Harold Macmillan in the van, not only introduced further slum clearance programmes, the establishment of high-quality social housing, we also had a Clean Air Act at that time, and, of course, one of the biggest um, uh, real-terms increases in national health funding of any period in government. So the idea that the Conservative tradition is indifferent to uh, public health interventions is totally wrong. And it's wrong uh, because, uh, as uh, every single panellist here has reminded us, it is not just the case that if you are a Conservative, you care about the national community. You want to ensure that people lead fruitful lives. You recognise the interrelation of factors that hold people back in being able to lead the fullest possible life. It's also the case, even if you are the most economically reductionist, even if you are the most uh, uh, bean countery, abacus-focused, uh, uh, econometric policymaker. It obviously, manifestly, obviously makes sense to improve public health. A, because unless you do, the demand for the National Health Services resources will only grow. And B, you want to have people economically contributing for as long as possible. We have a situation now in our welfare system where a significant number of people who want to claim universal credit have to go through a, uh, 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 an assessment process, which a health professional leads in order to, uh, to, to, to see uh, whether or not they're uh, suitable for uh, both universal credit and additional support into work. It takes 18 months at the moment for that process to be concluded. That is radically economically inefficient, and one of the reasons, there are a number of administrative reasons, but one of the reasons for that is the st- the, the, the poor public health of so many. Um, and again, that poor public health um, emanates from a variety of factors. So quite rightly, many of the panellists have talked about food, diet and exercise because the UK is one of the, I think it's the second fattest country in Europe. Um, I think the Maltese uh, um, uh, take the biscuit, as it were. Um, uh, but that, you know, that, that, that is, as everyone's mentioned, one of the reasons why, you can debate other government policy failures and successes, one of the reasons why COVID hit us so, so badly. But it's obviously manifestly the case that in order to uh, 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 inhibit the growth of uh, a particular form of diabetes, to reduce the pressure on the National Health Service, to ensure that people are better able to cope with respiratory diseases and others, that we need to be uh, 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 healthier or enabled, supported uh, uh, to make healthier food choices. Um, and again, no one is trying to say, as Camilla pointed out, that we are uh, banning or restricting people enjoying food. Manifestly not. What we're all seeking to do is to ensure that an industry, which, as Henry's report laid out, has itself become addicted to a particular way of formulating food, that that industry can be helped to get us back into a healthier position overall. But, of course, it's not just obesity. It is also the case that we have a problem, which, again, the COVID pandemic laid um, out, of poor housing. Overcrowded housing, poor conditions particularly affects people with, um, uh, 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 when it comes to respiratory diseases as well. But overall, it undermines um, uh, 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 our capacity to lead uh, healthier lives overall. And strikingly, um, when we were doing research for the Leveling Up White Paper, we saw the obvious correlation between poor health outcomes and poor economic outcomes in particular parts of the UK. And you can see various different factors coming together. So it is the case that... If you have an economically deprived area, it will also be the case that there will be a higher proportion of obesity, so a higher instance of obesity, a higher instance of smoking, a higher instance of alcohol abuse, and of course, critically, a higher instance of poor mental health. Mm-hmm. Now, when I first sort of got involved in politics and all the rest of it, I'll be honest, my moment of conversion, I thought all this stuff about mental health, people are attempting to medicalize just feeling a bit grim. People are attempting to uh, say that uh, 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 the frailty to which we are all heir must now be 
you know, a, a government's responsibility. But the more that I've looked at and the more that I've studied the situation that we face, the more that it is clear that poor mental health, often contributed to as a result of poverty and poor diet, is a contributory factor to drains on the NHS, to poor productivity, and just to human misery. So, uh, again, we have to be careful about policing the boundaries of what is genuinely poor mental health that requires um, uh, uh, appropriate intervention, and what is sometimes the medicalising of other you know, ways of responding to adversity. But it is undoubtedly the case that we need to focus on all of these concerns. Now, of course, for any government looking to um, uh, deal with the uh, economic headwinds that we face at the moment, the range of options that have been laid out um, are on this table and the policy interventions that have been put forward and advocated for will seem like rather a lot to bite off. But ultimately, if we are going to ensure that the economic growth measures that the government is quite rightly uh, going to bring forward are going to be sustainable and durable, we have to learn, um, as Camilla and others have pointed out, from uh, the example of other jurisdictions that have made the most of the productive uh, uh, human capital that we all have. Um, and unless we can get these big health interventions right, that it will continue to be the case that spending on the NHS will grow, that the uh, productivity of this country uh, will be held back, and the quality of the lives of the people who we care about will be uh, inhibited. So that's why uh, we do need to have action this day. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Right, I'm now going to take questions from everyone in the audience. I'm going to take them in threes. If you can say who you are and who you're representing, um, if you are indeed representing an organisation, that'd be great. So the gentleman with the glass is just here. There's no microphone, so um, just okay. announce yourself quite loudly so everyone can hear. Hi, uh, Tony Diver from the Daily Telegraph. Can I just um, can I address what feels like the elephant in the room here, which is that since this trust became Prime Minister, a lot of the health measures that have been adopted or at least trailed under Boris Johnson's administration have since been dropped or in the process of being dropped. And that includes the tax on sugary drinks and uh, the advertising of sugary products near checkouts. I wonder, perhaps address this specifically to Michael, who commissioned Henry's report and Henry who wrote it. Do you feel let down by Liz Truss's administration in, in that regard? Okay, two more questions and we'll, we'll go on to answers next. Uh, gentleman at the back. Hi, uh, I'm Vinay, I'm a dental surgeon uh, and just finished a master's in public policy at the University of Oxford. Um, I think one of the great tragedies is that we talked about prevention but, and we talked about health being one of the main um, issues that the government should be dealing with, but in each department we don't have someone representing health. Because if we're saying health comes across all different departments, whether it's housing and whether it's... Uh, you know, the economy, but surely we should have a representative of health in every single department. Just like in medicine, we compartmentalize everything. So we say we're dentists, we're doctors, we're surgeons, we, we compartmentalize everything. But we, we know that everything is linked, um, your cardiovascular, your dementia, your gum disease, if I may say so. Um, so I was wondering if there's any plans in government to do that, because then we can really um, champion prevention as frame it as freedom as we were saying so I think if there's any plans to discuss that next question the lady just over here okay. thanks hi my name is Gina Ciceroni I'm the CEO of the Fair Education Alliance representing 250 member organizations I was just at a session um, where we talked about the universal credit and the challenges with um, the fact that it hasn't increased. And Michael, given your points around the underpinning factor of poverty and the associations with health and in particular mental health, I'm really curious to the panel's views of poverty obviously underpins health, it underpins outcomes in education, and what we need to be doing in terms of addressing the root causes um, of poverty to solve this once and for all. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to come to you first, Michael, maybe on the... Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I think... Um, uh, on, on the first point raised by Tony, I think that there's been um, um, a, a lot of speculation, um, and that speculation um, I, I didn't will be bodied forth in the way that you mentioned. So um, uh, I've worked very closely with uh, Therese in the past. Um, she is a, an evidence-led politician with a scientific background. Um, it is entirely understandable that any new government or any new minister 
will always want to review the policy landscape that they inherit in order to make sure that they can have confidence in um, the uh, already existing policies as well as developing their own new ones. So uh, I have every confidence that um, the vital importance of having a strong, forward-leaning public health strategy alongside the other changes that may be required in order to uh, strengthen the position of the NHS um, uh, will be undertaken. Absolute confidence. Um, uh, on um, the point from um, our friend who's dental surgeon, yes, I mean, a- again, all, almost all health problems are interconnected. I'm obviously not a clinician. Um, uh, to take a look at them, obviously not a clinician. Um, um, but one of the things that, that, that we do recognise is that, by definition, the human body is a system, um, and uh, you can... Uh, uh, we should ensure, and the levelling up by people is an attempt to ensure, that when we're thinking about the different factors that drive uh, health and well-being, that we look at the contribution that different government departments can make, because we need to have system thinking in government, just as any clinician would have system thinking when looking um, at a patient presenting. Um, and on the point about um, universal credit and uh, uh, benefits overall, again, uh, Clevy Smith, as Secretary of State, um, uh, is someone with whom I've worked, uh, a very details-oriented, very painstaking, caring person. Um, and so I'm absolutely convinced that uh, uh, she will uh, run that department in the, in the very best traditions of One Nation Conceptors. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come to you next, Henry. So just on, on the specific point about being disappointed, when you do, uh, uh, I, this is the second independent review I've done, and you, you embark upon an independent review realising that uh, most of them get written and then you know, thrown up in the air on publication, few shotgun blasts from the Telegraph, uh, and then what's left, what's left gets uh, left on the shelf to, cut, to kind of gather dust. And so I was quite careful to think about like, what can you do to make it hard to kill? Like, how, do you, how do you protect it against this cycle? And try to do two things. One was to change the narrative, and in particular the narrative of the junk food cycle. And I'm really pleased that that is now something that actually is becoming really mainstream. People are realising it's not actually nutty to say that there's this link between commercial incentive and, and companies. And then on the other side, on the environmental side, the idea of the invisibility of nature. And then the second was specific policies. And the government have actually put in place about half the policies. Therese, I worked with at uh, a little bit, where I saw her at DEFRA, so she was there while I was there. And as Michael says, she is very detail-focused. Um, she doesn't like she doesn't like a lot of the stuff that politicians like. She's not particularly keen on stakeholders or uh, kind of outside communication of any form. But she really <laughs> likes. <laughs> but she really likes. And if you look at what happened during the pandemic, she really likes getting stuff done. And DWP was one of the most successful departments in government throughout the pandemic. And I have absolutely no doubt that. She will. You, you don't meet a, a minister or a secretary of state who's come out of the uh, out of the, the the department of health, department of health and social care, who has the say if they had those prejudices, has them when they go in. I'm pretty clear. Chris Whitty will be sitting down with her as we speak, going through the data, and she will be thinking, "We've got to do something about this." So I, I'm, you know, I'm optimistic that I, I'd be very, very surprised if it all just got kicked off the long grass. I have to say, I think the health inequality strategy being scrapped seems like a, a big shame. Um, I think if you if you cut over, it's a really pragmatic speaking. How long has she been in the department now? A few weeks. Three. So she's inheriting something that Sarge inherited from whoever it was before him, and no. then <laughs> you know, uh, um, <laughs> and you know, you, you've got to take. And uh, I think the way in which that, if it's happening in Defra at the moment, so all the rumours coming out of Defra that we're going to scrap Elms, we do that. It takes these incredibly complex departments with very complicated agendas. And actually, you'd be rather worried if Secretary of State went in and just, without before they'd kind of oriented themselves and got their feet under the desk and understood what was going on. So I completely understand pausing. I think that's fine. The question is, what comes next? Camilla, do you want to come in next? Um, yes, yeah, sure. So, so to our dental friend, and congratulations on your MPP, because um, it's brilliant when people do both, because they you bridge off into policy. I mean, I totally agree that it's interconnected. I, I think it's really difficult to put... I mean, people always want everything to be in every department, because they make the same argument. What I would suggest is that the government <coughs> adopts a target for, healthy, for improving healthy life expectancy, mm. um, which I think 
one. I mean, there's been so many governments. I think we did get one government to which did that. I'm not hugely in favour of targets, but that would allow you, I mean, as a government level, to drive some of this. Um, to our friend at the Telegraph, I'm sorry you didn't get Mr. Gove to give you the answer that you needed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, why not try? Um, the one of the reasons I made a laboured the point that the sugar tax was about reformulation and not a syntax was because newspapers like yours have not understood that. The Daily Mail has understood that. When I was trying to get this through number 10, I actually had a daily meeting where I had to present the Times and the Mail versus the Sun and the Daily Telegraph. And there was a huge row about, was this going to be another pasty tax because the Telegraph and the Sun were going to fine. Um, but I do think it's important that we do understand at least what the tax was about. And Boris went through exactly the same process. So he went through the process, this is all Garcia, nanny state syntax. Eventually somebody, first one got ill, <laughs> as you remember, then somebody explained to him that the sugar tax, and by the way the sugar tax is not the most important part of the package, um, was actually about taking ingredients out, and he then adopted quite a lot of this stuff. So um, I, I just think it's, I think clearly there's a pause, which I think is much better than scrapping it, which she was going to scrap it a week ago, the same process they'll be going through again. And you're absolutely right, Henry. I mean, you need to go back to the evidence and look. And we have long discussions about should we put calories on menus. The, the advertising watershed, to me, was really important to update because I could see that my own kids were watching. Basically, there's an exemption for family shows. So ITV came to me and they said, "What well, you can't, you know, have this advertising watershed ban." Um, well, so because they would lose advertising revenue. While well, simultaneously claiming that the advertise, the endless adverts for junk food made no impact on the nation's children. I mean, it's just not, you know, you've got to, you can believe one or the other, but you can't simultaneously believe both. So, so I hope, yeah, I hope we'll come back to this in the end. Just on Camilla's point, I think uh, your white paper included a target on healthy life expectancy. It did. And I think, did Matt Hancock also introduce a target on healthy life expectancy? So I think we've had a target for quite a while. I think the challenge is committing to the action that <laughs> delivers on it. Um, and, and as we know, like setting the target is the easy bit. It's, it's the bit that follows. So um, that's why we're here today to work out how we so do that. The CCC was the Climate Change Committee is a good example of that. So if you set a target that is in the statute and then you have an independent body uh, reviewing government progress along that target and suggesting... Uh, improvements, it just creates again a feedback loop yeah. where the two things are, are iterated, <laughs> otherwise the target just disappears and it will keep on it. James, do you want to come in next? Um, I, I, I'm also persuaded by the link between poverty, mental health and <coughs> physical health, but yeah. I don't think we should only focus on that link as though the only solution to the nation's poor health was a minimum income or some kind of massive redistribution of wealth. There are huge benefits from doing health and care differently and putting a greater emphasis on prevention. The NHS currently spends about 2% of its budget on prevention. It is a late stage acute sickness service and it simply is not built or considered its, its priorities to be around prevention. The public, the voting public quite rightly are very concerned about when will they get their operation. I can see a day very soon when people will be clamoring for when do I get my health check age 40 that tells me when I'm 40 whether I'm due to get cancer or some kind of heart disease and that that is the really um, acute political risk that we're facing and when we switch from being um, input orientated around operations rather than output of, uh, orientated as in healthy longevity that's when we would know we'll have won this battle. Holly, I'm sorry. Don't worry, we've got lots of Ollie Dolly. names in there. <laughs> no, no. It's getting hotter in this Holly, room. Ollie and Dolly. Dolly, over to you. Um, I mean, the, I want to come back down because the rational assumptions around cross-departmental working and policy ideas and all of the end targets, they're all rational ideas about how to improve this issue. But until we get over this perception, ideological barrier, identity clash-based problem, we're never going to see this change prog or progression <clears throat> and continuous progression that we need in this area because you keep getting this stop and start every time a new government or new minister is appointed that is new to the issue. If that clash is still there and hasn't been reconciled, the match between people's core beliefs 
with this agenda, you're going to get that time and time again. And history just proves that we have this nightmare policy cycle that we can't avoid. And just to give you an example of the Sun being a very good example of this, I had a Sun journalist yesterday say, "Congratulations on your PhD in nanny state bollocks." So, <laughs> prime drivers Charming. of that, exactly, prime drivers of that idea. And one massive uh, perception barrier with this agenda is that any intervention on food is perceived to increase the price of it and to take away choice. Mm. And those mm. two things are very, very difficult for Conservatives in particular to reconcile and for the Labour Party to reconcile because we actually saw West treating yeah. during the Labour Party conference not communicating. I want to say, hopefully, he understands how the SDIL actually works, <laughs> the sugar tax actually works. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that this was political. But he was communicating about the SDIL incorrectly because he was communicating it in a way that uh, perceived it to be increasing the prices of certain food products, drink products, and that is fundamentally incorrect. It was not designed that way. So these, uh, and it's the opposite when it also comes to taking away choice, um, because when it comes to promotions, which for example, the buy one, get one freeze, not only are they not on all food, which is often forgotten, it's often seen as like they would take away promotions on all food. They're on a very, very certain type of food, ultra processed food, high in fat, salt and sugar. And promotions are there to encourage people to buy, to spend and consume more. So in a cost of living crisis, to say that taking away promotions will actually increase the cost and make food more expensive is also fundamentally incorrect. But these are rational arguments. These are evidence-based rational arguments against an irrational, ideologically led clash of belief system and this issue agenda. So we need to reframe these arguments to make the health agenda appealing and aspirational for Conservatives. Until we do that, we're going to keep in this nightmare cycle for a very long time. And Chris, um, before we come back to the audience for questions, so get your questions ready, do you want to just comment on the health and all policies agenda? Because we're definitely doing thinking on that as part of the Commission. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's well known that um, that good health requires levers from across government, including to, to tackle poverty. And, and that comes out in our analysis is very strong. So I think it's a fundamental question. Um, I was searching for a government we haven't mentioned from history. And there's a, uh, a, a good example from from it's not not a conservative, I'm afraid, but from Lloyd George. Um, and he creates the first ministry of Health, but it's, it's it's an entirely different conception of the Ministry of Health than the one we have, uh, well, our Department of Health and Social Care today. It has far more sweeping powers. It has great extent control of, of housing. It has lots of education policy, lots of air um, pollution policy. So it essentially brings in big swathes of what we have now in in terms of the levelling up housing, local government department, and, uh, and, and some of the others as well. Um, and of course, we have... Uh, a much more kind of acute system today. We have far less of those levers, but that's to say that there are options and formulations of how we do policy, how we define health that I think can be slightly different. Now, the question is, if we're thinking about trying to make the policy making process better, do we want massive reorganization of, of structures or do we want something slightly different? And I think there are probably ways that structural change can be useful. We can think about the benefits that we've had from things like uh, Prime Minister chaired health inequality strategies, and we know that that, that, that kind of cross-government, prime ministerially backed uh, program does work. But there's probably actually something softer that can bring the value of health across government in a way that mimics that kind of departmental shift, but doesn't require big changes in the instruments of government. And I think that's to say that the conception of value that we have across government is quite pliable. It can change over time. And at the moment, our conception of value has very little place for, for health. And I think the levers that you'd use to change the conception of value, well, that's where you can start to talk about targets. That's where you can learn a huge amount from climate change and the CCC mm -hmm. and the kind of instruments that we've done to bake that in there. Those are kind of things that we're looking at very closely. So the Commission on Health and Prosperity will be bringing out um, an interim report which very much focuses on if we want health policy to play a bigger role in the decision making that we have across government, how do we go about doing that? Because health and policy is nice rhetoric, isn't it? But no one's ever really put in place a plan for that. Um, so there's some answer there, but there's also a watch this space. Great. Um, so the gentleman just here, I'm going to take five questions so we get as through as many people as possible. Um, so my name's Joshua Dugdale, and um, it's a really fascinating conversation. And there's obviously been a focus on obesity. Um, the thing that I would like to raise is this uh, possibility of this amazing compound out there, it's called psilocybin, 
which currently is Schedule 1 and Class A. And psilocybin, there's a lot of evidence now coming through from many different studies of the ability to change your learned behaviour. And so you're able to get rid of your addictions, change it, sort out your anxiety, possibly your depression. But currently, it's Schedule 1, Class A, which means that it's very difficult to do medical research. There is a campaign called Pardot Global, which would change the schedule from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2, which makes it as dangerous as heroin and cocaine. So psilocybin, which is the active compound of magic mushrooms, is more dangerous than, than cocaine and heroin. And it's got the potential to revolutionise healthcare in the sense that one hit could mean that you don't have to take uh, antidepressants continuously. It can change your learned behaviour and it can get rid of your addictions. It can save the NHS an absolute fortune one in ten pounds of NHS money is spent on mental health. And I'd like all of your comments on this, if possible, because I think it's a really important issue. Okay. Uh, Richard. Yeah, thanks, Harry. Richard Sloggett from the Future Health Research Centre, former uh, SPAD at the Department of Health. Um, my question to the panel is on how you harness the parent power that Camilla talked about in that conversion. When we looked at banning energy drinks from under 16, it's a different consultation. We found that the response was 92% of, of the feedback was, this is a good idea, this is a good idea. How do you harness that parent power and have the argument with those sun editors that you mentioned, Donny? Who else is there? gentleman on the far right. Hi, uh, yeah. I, uh, I feel like there's one quite crucial aspect of someone's health and wellbeing that isn't really talked about, which is sleep. Um, like in the same as, in, it's the same pillar as, I guess, like nutrition and fitness, which is massive. Michael Gove, you correctly touched on mental health, which is up and coming, but in the same breath as those three, I'd say a fourth pillar is sleep. I mean, it affects your diet, it affects the way you eat, it affects your way your gut works, it affects the productivity the next day. Um, there's even more intricate aspects where a kid going through high school has a later <coughs> circadian rhythm than someone earlier or an adult, which potentially is an argument for later school times. Like, I feel like sleep is um, potentially the key aspect which under underpins all nutrition, fitness, and mental health being the other maybe core three pillars. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there's a four pillar approach, which is eat, move, mind, and sleep, which is almost like there's four things that the government could maybe like run through government in the way that they're the four crucial pillars. But yeah, I do think sleep underpins everything, and uh, I never hear it talked about in any of these discussions, like not even the word mentioned once, which is quite worrying that the government doesn't actually understand. Great. And um, the lady in the front here. Thank you. Um, Pamela Evans, former teacher, very different subject. Um, initially, nutrition and food science. And I'd like to introduce the idea of what's, go what's, what's going to happen to our children. How are they going to be formed? What are you going to do to link the de departments of health, social care, um, those that are dealing with um, poverty um, among families and the Department of Education and Science. Thank you. Great. The lady just here, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Barbara Craven from the Children's Food Campaign and Sustain. Um, in a, another room not too far from here, um, the business secretary apparently has been urging uh, people to put chocolate oranges back next to the tills as a silent protest. Um, and so my, my question is about how do we square how do we square this kind of clash around cutting business red tape? Um, I think one of the great things with the sugar tax was the way in which health and treasury came together on the advertising health and DCMS came together. The sugar tax also, although it's not hypothecated, we know the 300 million pounds a year it's raising has been part of the the, the budget discussions with the Department for Education and has contributed to the establishment of the National School Breakfast Programme, £200 million for the holiday activities and food programme. So, but it feels like we've got a real clash coming down the line on business <coughs> and making sure that health priorities um, are at the centre of any decision making where it's about getting business involved because if we were to repeal the sugar tax who are we incentivizing because the businesses that have reformulated have got nothing to gain from that it's only the businesses that have been the laggards 
So I think for me it's about how do we make sure we get the progressive businesses in the interest of progressive businesses doing the right thing on health um, at the centre stage. It's good to know the business secretary is focusing on the big things. Um, <laughs> Michael, do you want to open up first? Yes, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll try and be very brief. Um, uh, uh, so we, there may be room for even more questions. Uh, the point from Joshua Dubdale about... Um, um, I don't know enough about the science, but it's certainly the case that uh, there is um, clearly an emerging debate about the influence of uh, psychedelics on uh, uh, you know, the capacity to deal, as you quite rightly point out, with depression, um, uh, addiction and other areas. Um, uh, anything that we can do to facilitate the uh, uh, safe deployment of that research, it clearly has to be a good thing. Um, it is, you know, a, a, an area of increasing focus. So, again, I don't know either the scientific or indeed the, the regulatory details, but it seems to me that um, uh, your point is right. Um, uh, on uh, uh, harnessing parent, parent power, the Richard's point about uh, any drinks and so on, I think others would be better equipped to uh, speak than me about uh, how to um, be a good parent. Um, <laughs> on sleep um, it's a very very important point and again more research more public concern um, uh, and uh, uh, it, it is an area where if I were to say anything more I would be fundamentally out of my depth the only thing I was going to say in response to uh, Barbara's question about um, uh, making sure that what happens in our schools and what happens when you think about public health comes together uh, Henry is better equipped to uh, answer than me because of the work that he did on the school food plan. Thank you. Over to you, Henry. No pressure. So, <laughs> so um, just a, a briefly on sleep. So it is. So the, the the there's a lot of evidence that sleep, in particular, because my area is food, but that sleep impacts the release of uh, hormones that affect hunger, in particular, might mm. make you leptin resistant. Leptin is the hormone when you put on weight, you release leptin, and it makes you. Uh, it makes you feel less hungry, and in fact, if you have uh, if you have a gene that doesn't uh, that means you don't produce leptin, you get unbelievably obese until you're injected with leptin, and then you don't feel hungry anymore. <coughs> and there's quite a lot of evidence that sleep affects that. So I'm sure that will end up being much more central as the science is still just a little bit out there. Um, on on schools, so the the issue that so I did some work on schools on school food. I have a charity that works. We work over a hundred schools now, trying to improve the the food served in schools and the food education in those schools. I spend a lot of time in schools, and I think that at the moment that there there are basically three things that you need to be the case uh, for a school to to do well in this area. First of all someone needs to lead the change. So every good school you go to, a head teacher, normally business manager, um, someone in the school said, we need to do this better. The second thing that they have in common in the, in the food and health area is that it is a whole school approach. Yeah. So food and exercise are not add-ons, they're built into everything. Mm -hmm. So they're in your mass classes, they're in your... And, uh, and you know, in a lot of schools still, the... The canteen staff literally come in and out of the school through a different door than everyone else in the school. I mean, it's absolutely astonishing. So you need that whole school approach. And then the final thing is you need to fo you need to focus on the needs of the child. So, for example, if you're trying to get ch help children eat better food, you, you need to make sure that the ca the canteen isn't noisy. You need to make sure that they can play football at lunchtime as well as eat their dinner and that trick them. You need to make sure the food tastes good. You don't talk too much about, you don't talk at all about health. Mm -hmm. And I think that at that level, we need to have, we need to find ways of really bringing skills into these schools and increasing the pressure on head teachers to want to change it. Mm -hmm. One of my recommendations was that every school should have to have an accreditation. The government would say, these bodies can accredit you and train you. We will say that these four bodies, five bodies, they can apply to us to be licensees, but you have to have someone helping you with that stuff. What the government did was say you have to put a statement on a website saying what you're doing. It's, 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 that's, it's completely pointless. It'll just be, you'll, you'll download a form, which is the statement from the internet, if you don't care, and if you do care, you're doing it anyway. So I think getting accreditation and getting experts into those schools to help them adopt that whole school approach <coughs> is really the, the key to transformation from the bottom up. On parent power, by the way, just sorry, on, on the, so before we published the food strategy, I went to see 
uh, all of the editors of all of the newspapers kind of roll the pitch. Turns out roll the pitch is quite a good thing to do if you're uh, announcing a new policy. And, uh, and kind of understand what they wanted. And they broke in this way. So the mail uh, came out for the sugar tax, that the bigger one has gone now, but they came out for it. Interesting with the mail, actually, the, the, the newspaper mail did. The online mail, which is now a completely different newspaper, uh, absolutely hated it. And I'm now, my, well, I'm, I, I quite regularly appear in the, in the uh, mail online. My, my caption of the, my photograph is, the obese millionaire who wanted to tax your food. <laughs> <laughs> my mother's very proud. Um, so, uh, so but, but the sun was really interesting. So I went to see the sun. They kind of get it, but that is so much part of their narrative. And it goes right back to Murdoch coming and wanting to shake up newspapers and be louder and have bigger letters. And I think that parent power idea is a really interesting one, which is, you know, for example, in Jamie Oliver's um, program on school foods, the woman who pushed the chips through the thing ran the local fish and chip shop. It was a joke. But all mm. the papers kind of blew it up as if that was what people think. And when you go to these communities which I've done, people are absolutely fed up yeah. with this. And so the question is, I don't know the answer to it, but with the Sun in particular, their readers actually are not in line with them. But it's quite fun saying, no, it's quite fun saying, it's quite fun saying, leave your chocolate orange on the counter. You know, so it's how you kind of break through that mischief mm. to what actually their readers want. I'm not, I don't know how you do that, but I, the Sun is the key to that debate. James? Um, uh, can I uh, uh, address Joshua's point about um, uh, hallucinogenics? I, I don't know about the specific drug you mentioned. What I do know is two things. When I was an innovation minister, one is there are a lot of people pushing drugs that don't work. Hydrochloroquine, uh, mm. President Trump being a really <laughs> vivid example. I bought hydrochloroquine because mm. I was under so much pressure that this might be the miracle cure. The doctors never had a clinical uh, trial for it and it hadn't been peer reviewed. So that turned out to be a big mistake. So I have a lot of respect for the peer review and clinical trial process. That said, the rate of development and the rate of change in the technology around uh, medicine and therapies at the moment is so vast that we have to try harder to keep up. And the process of assessing the medicines and the um, resources that go into clinical trials are completely off the pace, uh, in my view. And if we're going to try to make uh, life sciences a champion industry for the UK, which it is, then we need to, to really focus on that. Cannabinoids is another area where we haven't been able to resolve really basic cross-governmental liaison, on, uh, as you say, on between the Home Office and, uh, and NHS research labs. And therefore, this vast area, which brings so much solace and, and, and comfort to really long-suffering uh, patients, is not properly developed. And I think that we do need to have a change in our research culture. Uh, hallucinogenics for veterans being another one. Dolly. Um, I want to link on to what Henry was touching upon with the sort of mischief and fun because another major barrier to this agenda um, which taps into how do you get the kind of you know parent voice and focus on children and stuff to become politically popular is quite challenging when unhealthy food is used as a political popularity tool. So it's, it's used as a way to be seeing down with the pe working people. So you see politicians, you know, posing with bacon butties, uh, raising pints. This is something that James and I've talked at length about, the fact that Rishi Sunak, he doesn't even drink, will do the whole pint pulling, raising pint thing because it makes you look as if you're down with the working people. And that is a very, very difficult, again, optics barrier to if you're seen to be a middle class patronizing you know boring healthy food you're out of touch so again another on the kind of framing and perception issue with this is that the political popularity of unhealthy food is incredibly deeply embedded and yet that is often weaponized and i remember an interview that henry gave with uh, giles corran and you so brilliantly talked about actually doing the focus groups over the national food strategy and talking to people around the country and it's like the truck drivers, they don't want to go to a petrol station where the food is crap. Mm -hmm. um, so it's patronising and it's almost politicians trapping people in a state of poor health just because of the political popularity and not wanting to be perceived in that way. And I would say the vehicle to overcome that because all the polling shows that the public are, are actually massively in favour of these measures 
And Jane Ellison, when she was uh, public health minister, uh, was massive on the parent narrative and child focused narrative um, and said that this is so popular. And when in 2015 they just uh, brought through the Conservative, the coalition government's already just brought through all of the very strong tobacco reduction policies. And there were all these threats by the tobacco industry that MPs wouldn't get voted in if they introduced them. They said it's not politically popular, not popular with the public. And they ended up getting voted back in as a majority government. And that was sort of the uh, reinforcement that they needed to know that this agenda was popular. Um, but SEN, the Conservative Environment Network, as a group, has been incredibly effective at shif shifting the narrative in the Conservative Party around the environment. And we now have politicians who, seven years ago, wouldn't identify with the environmental movement at mm -hmm. all, but needed this incredibly political, party political, strategic vehicle to build up those narratives, to prepackage those arguments, to make it appealing, aspirational to have this group that people could identify with. And there isn't something like that for public health. Um, so that is a massive way to do that, to bring in that. Because if they don't hear those voices of the parents and see that polling in this strategic place with the arguments that they feel comfortable with. And I'd say on, on the drugs one, I, I mean, I don't know the science well enough at all to comment on, on that particular area. But of course, in any uh, area of, of health, science, whatever, when you don't have the evidence, you often get the it doesn't work argument. And that is so frustrating because the kind of no evidence fallacy being that it doesn't work is also inaccurate. We need the evidence. And that often actually on, on a policy level means that you need to introduce the policy to build the evidence on how something actually works in practice. And you often get opposition groups using the lack of evidence because the policy hasn't been introduced as a way of saying it doesn't work. And so be very careful any time you hear of people opposing policies that haven't actually been introduced because they don't work. We don't know how they work yeah. until they're actually introduced. And that's the very difficulty with these sorts of things. And it's the same thing if something's illegal. It's very difficult to build the evidence on, on how it works and, and on sleep. I agree. <laughs> it's a very difficult area to, to introduce, you know, government policy on. But you, we, the sleep is often included in, in government policies. But... Um, it's a very difficult thing for people to talk about how uh, you introduce interventions around it. I think Ed Miliband will tell you that bacon sandwiches are not a great comms tool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Chris, do you want to really quickly on parent power and then I'm, I'll go for another few questions before we wrap up. Yeah, great. I, I, I just wanted to throw in, because the, the first study I, I did in my, in my research career was, was on parent power and it was uh, you know, interviews with parents and, and children on, um, on their experiences of it. And the sense of disempowerment because of things like advertising and marketing was was really stark, and we saw actually very compelling uh, anecdote, well, stories of uh, throughout it of um, of pester power instead of parent power of um, of very cleverly targeted you know advertisements that that um, that kind of led to you know child led demand and 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 in fact that's very difficult uh, if it's constant if it's if it's strategic if it's all encompassing. So I think probably there's a case that we've talked a lot about the individual freedom point that some of the policies that have been put forward can can unleash but actually I think parental freedom and re-empowerment is, is probably part of that equation as well um, yeah I'll stop there quick great if we take maybe three more quick questions if you go into a statement I'm going to have to cut you off lady in the middle Paula Gledhill I'm head of public affairs for Dimensions which supports people with early disabilities and autism um, who die on average between 23 and 26 years um, before the general population because of access um, issues to healthcare. But really my question is about GP training and I wondered that really if we want the NHS to be about prevention and about health and wellbeing, um, my understanding is that GPs don't learn about nutrition. Um, isn't that really something that's fundamental to their education? Great. One more question, gentlemen. Mm. Um, I'm um, Andrew Dinsmore, counsellor in um, Hammersmith and Fulham. Um, obviously having longer, healthier lives is great, I think we can all agree with that. Is one inevitable consequence that you'd have to increase the retirement age? And my question is, how politically feasible is that? And Path. Hi, I'm Path, I'm a medic and I work at IPDR. Um, the, bottom, the title of this talk was Can Help Revitalise the Economy, so it's probably a question directed to, to Michael and Lord Bethel, which is, how does, how does health, the broad health sector, the NHS, its workforce, but also the life science innovation industry. How does that fit into this government's plan for growth? Great. 
Uh, so we've got GP training and nutrition, retirement and the political feasibility of raising the retirement age and plan for growth. Michael, do you want to kick us off? Uh, yes, I, um, uh, I did not know that. It would seem to me to be logical that it should be included in GP training. But again, uh, uh, it is not an area where I can pronounce with absolute authority. Um, um, on uh, the retirement age, I think Andrew makes a, an important point. This is it, It's difficult politically, but we do have to adjust to an aging society. Camilla, who's now left, has written the best book there is um, on uh, uh, the consequences of an aging society. So I would recommend Extra Time, available from HarperCollins. Uh, I'd recommend it to, <laughs> to everyone here. Um, and then on the final point about the economy, James is far, far better equipped than me to uh, answer this, because uh, as Innovation Minister at DHSC, he was responsible not just for dealing with the, as you know, with the, 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 the pandemic, but also overseeing um, uh, 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 a strategy which was building on uh, our existing strengths in uh, life sciences. I just say three things. The first is that the NHS is a formidable asset because of the way in which, if we use suitably anonymized data, the fact that you have the, as you know, the entire population there means that our capacity to use that data in a smart way gives us an enormous competitive advantage. Visiting Israel, where they have essentially four different competing health providers, but essentially, you know, the one and four, it's, it's, it's like having a sort of regional, uh, it's not quite completely regional, it's like, it's like having four different flavours of the NHS, as it were, um, more or less, oversimplified. But nevertheless, that enables them to use data in an incredibly powerful way in order to uh, uh, support health tech and innovation. That is the, the first point that I would make. The second one is that uh, the... Uh, investment over time by a series of governments um, in helping to attract uh, uh, pharma investment into this country he, uh, has been hugely successful and James was be at the forefront of that even preceding his role in DHSC. And then the third thing that I would say is uh, there will be interventions which are not traditional pharma interventions but will be enabled by our better understanding of uh, uh, genetics which create huge opportunities. And again, uh, uh, I am not in a position to know with authority which institutions in the UK are leading in this area. But I do think that sometimes you do have to double down in terms of uh, investment through UKRI. I'm convinced that UKRI are doing that because the people who are running it at the moment are people who are very impressive. But James is better equipped to answer than me. Over to you, James, when you pick up on that. Michael, you put it very, very well. Um, the intention during the pandemic, the massive investment that we put into public health, uh, would lead to a renaissance in the public health disciplines in the country. What I mean by that is testing, diagnostics, data, which um, uh, others have, have talked about, knowing in terms of surveillance, uh, research, uh, and in terms of clinical intervention, what, what was happening with people, and mobilizing the great new industries of AI, big data, genomics, mm -hmm. in order to uh, uh, address the challenge of the virus. So that's what we did during the pandemic. And I was really hopeful that that would lead to a, to a big new push on public <coughs> health, health across the piece. Now, in fact, what's happened is that that has been uh, downgraded. A lot of the infrastructure and the personnel that were involved in that um, have been let go. And I happen to think that that's a bit of a shame. I don't think it's the end of the show. Um, as others have said, the team that uh, are in DHSE are very thoughtful. Uh, they will see the figures for what they are. And the big hit that our workforce has taken this year from long COVID, from people who haven't been able to have the interventions that they need and caring for other people, 400,000 people out of the workforce is a wake-up call because the OBR have added 2.9 billion to the incapacity bill. That's going to that's gonna resonate in amongst Treasury and in health. So I am hopeful that what we learned during the pandemic about the power of public health <coughs> will be revisited and there will be a, a reinvestment in these basic skills. Henry, can I ask you to speak up on the nutrition and GP training point in particular? Yeah, so I think I, I want to talk about that and actually the longevity and the Tory party in their role. So you have a whole shift that needs to happen, not just in the way the Tory party think about it, but in the way medicine thinks about both prevention and cure. I was talking to Dolly's fiancé, who's a doctor, just the other day, about uh, what, what was in the course on nutrition and what wasn't. And it was basically how all of the kind of met metabolic mechanisms worked in the body, but nothing about the human and nothing about the system the human lives in. And then I was talking, I was listening to another podcast, an American doctor talking about how in their healthcare system, 
they get money for diagnosing specific illnesses and treating specific illnesses. Mm. But if you're looking at the whole body, you can't claim, you can't put in the chip yeah. that claims that. And she was looking at a, a, a patient who was depressed, they had uh, uh, um, pre-diabetes, had all diet-related, clearly diet-related issues, but you couldn't link them up. Uh, so I think that there are, you know, we clearly are going to get older, we need to get healthier, there need to be two huge shifts in our thinking. One, just the, the reaction against public health at all, but the other is a really fundamental shift in how everyone who is working, treating those people, pre-hospital, at-hospital doctors, thinks about the patient and thinks about yeah. actually how do we deal to keep these bodies healthy rather than uh, dealing with the explosions of pain that come as a result of the, the way they've been since they were 30, which then comes out and it's yeah. lost the health force. And I think listening to this panel, uh, it's, I feel uh, that there are some you know, really fantastic brains inside the Tory party who are going to who could potentially, you know, go some way towards solving that. So I feel much more optimistic now than I did uh, an hour and a half ago. Good. <laughs> That's what we like. <laughs> Dolly. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to talk about the, the GP training because um, it's, it's frustrating as in the health space overall. It's sort of 90-something percent dominated by conversations around the NHS. So the moment you're thinking about health in that way, you're thinking about people when it's sort of too late we're thinking about the treatment of people, waiting until they get sick and then treating them in that way. And so the training on G of GPs around nutrition, absolutely essential. And uh, we've had numerous conversations, my fiance and I, about this. And yeah, he converted to public health as well later. And even in that, didn't necessarily concentrate on nutrition in particular. So even within public health, you can end up in all sorts of different areas. So nutrition is a pretty niche area. And that's the same within government policy uh, around prevention as well. But the focus on the NHS is a really difficult issue. And then health overall, even when you've got that, mostly dominated by treatment-based focus, clinical care, health care, and it's thought of in that way politically, um, you have a, a situation where health doesn't even feature in the top priorities of a government. And when it's talked about by Liz Truss, we saw in her early speeches, she, she was talking about it purely in waiting times. So it was sort of literally stemming the incredibly crisis flow that they needed to deal with. It wasn't in the prevention space at all. And there was a Tory reform group, if anyone's familiar with that. It's sort of the more one nation uh, side of the Conservative Party did polling over the leadership. We were talking about this yesterday, did polling over the recent leadership. And it was polling over which leaders people, members wanted to have uh, win. And also the top priority uh, areas of that particular group. And in the top 15 policy areas, health did not feature. So even health overall doesn't feature in the top priorities of a group within the Conservative Party that one would consider, you know, amenable <laughs> or caring about this issue. So health is very, very low down politically. It isn't something that you see politicians making their um, legacy out of often. Um, uh, when I did my research to find out, you know, how governments think about it, it was described, the obesity agenda in particular was, des was described as niche um, and there are only so many political chips that a politician can spend on niche policy areas. So, you know, again, coming back to my point of getting that saliency up, but trying to move it away from the idea of automatically talking about the NHS and instead talking about the creation of health and, and thriving populations. And Lord Nigel Crisp, who was the chief executive of NHS England and, and Perm Sec of, of the Department of Health, has written beautifully about salutogenesis, <coughs> the causes of good health. So rather than... Uh, pathogenesis, the causes of disease, and thinking it automatically health is a prevention of disease. The causes of good health, the conditions where we can enable everyone to thrive, a sort of positive lens, and you just don't hear that talked about enough. So I would really urge you to, to go. And he actually talks a lot about the um, living more uh, years in good life, in good health, because that is cheaper. So even though it sounds as if we'll be spending loads because we've got all of these people in retirement, the biggest cost is the amount of years spent in poor health. And I can believe that stat. It's the first time I'd heard it, but Polly, who runs IPPR North, said yesterday that we've got people in the country that live, live only 19 years of their life in good health. I mean, that just should be not the case in a country like this. 
Um, so we need to, you know, and that expenditure, whether it's diabetes medication or whatever, is the automatic way to solve problems. We just have to get away from that medicalization when we think of health. And I think salutogenesis, thinking of thriving conditions for people to live their best possible lives is a great lens to think about this agenda. And Chris, briefly on the retirement age point, maybe. Yeah, I just want to throw in a last, a last IPR research plug, uh, which is that um, I think probably the answer is is, is, is probably not, because there's just so much um, still to go before the healthy life expectancy in this country reaches and catches up to where the state, state retirement age has got. And um, I think it's only, uh, depending on whether it's male or female, healthy life expectancy, it's 12% of local authorities or, or 17 have got an average healthy life expectancy that's higher than that state retirement age of, of 67 um, which is just testament to, to how far you know we are behind, and I think that's the economic incredulity, isn't it? Is that um, we have got to a position where the span we expect people to work is so much higher than the span we expect them to stay into good health, um, and I think that's probably the thing that we need to focus on. That gives us a mission, really, which is that the policies we've talked about here. And probably also, you know, there is a vision for the NHS within this, which is about kind of its role in facilitating the kind of healthy society and the, you know, kind of breaking the link between being in poor health and an economic disadvantage that we've been talking about. Um, but it gives us a target and a mission that, that I think we can take forward. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to round us up because it's unbelievably hot in here. Um, <laughs> thank you to our amazing panellists for today's conversation. In particular, thank you for being massive champions of this agenda within government. I really hope that you will continue to champion it and I hope you'll champion the commission when we launch our final report next year. And thank you to all of you for coming along today. Um, and I think there should be some food uh, outside, potentially, for those of you who need lunch. Oh, apparently other people are eating it. <laughs> you're, all, you're all healthier as a result.